Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome uh, to this lunchtime uh, webinar. Uh, I'm uh, Michael Collins, and I'm Director General here at the Institute of International and European Affairs, the IIEA, here in Dublin. And today I'm absolutely delighted, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, Congressman uh, Brendan Boyle, whom I formally introduced in just a, a moment. Um, but his contribution, obviously, at this lunchtime on this day is, is very timely. Uh, the incoming uh, Biden administration is beginning to take shape, as we all know, ahead of January's inauguration. And uh, meanwhile, on this side of the Atlantic, of course, EU-UK negotiations are continuing, uh, even as we speak. Um, the issues uh, surrounding the Northern Ireland Protocol and the protection of the peace process, something I know that uh, Congressman Boyle and indeed President-elect Biden himself have been very active on, has of course uh, moved on a little bit in recent days, thankfully. Uh, and I'm sure we get around to talking about that as well in the course of um, this afternoon's webinar. But let me just say a few words about uh, Congressman uh, Boyle. Congressman Boyle is a three-term member of the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the second uh, Pennsylvania Congressional District in around um, Philadelphia. Uh, he currently serves on the uh, House Ways and Means Committee and the House Committee on the Budget, having previously served two terms on the House Foreign Affairs um, Committee. Uh, prior to election uh, to the U.S. Congress, um, Congressman Boyle uh, was elected uh, to the Pennsylvania uh, State Assembly uh, in 2008, becoming the first Democrat to ever represent his legislative district. Um, and I was delighted to meet him in that capacity when he came to Washington now some 10 years ago uh, on a visit there. He came in to say hello to the embassy at the embassy, uh, where I was serving as ambassador, and it was an early indication of his interest in Ireland, and indeed his ambition also to become, um, as he eventually did become in 2015, a, a member of the US House of Representatives. Um, uh, Congressman Boyle received his BA in government from the University of Notre Dame, and his MA in public policy from Harvard University, John F. Kennedy School of Government. Before I hand the floor, the digital floor, to, uh, to the Congressman, let me just say a few words on the format. Uh, the Congressman will speak for about uh, 10 minutes or so um, and give a brief overview of the Biden administration's priorities when it comes to uh, Ireland transatlantic relations. And uh, then I will speak to him for a little while, um, uh, um, address a few questions. And of course, the floor is open uh, to any questions that you might have. So please uh, join the discussion, ask your questions, and we'll be free and we'll be delighted to get to as many as we possibly can uh, in, in the time available. Uh, just a reminder that the full event this afternoon, both the Congressman's initial remarks and the Q&A are on the record. Uh, please get involved in the discussion. As I say, submit your questions using the Zoom uh, dedicated Q&A function. And we ask that you please identify yourself when doing so. And, um, and when asking your question, and please uh, include your name, uh, your affiliation, if that's applicable. Lastly, we encourage you all to join the conversation on Twitter, if you use Twitter, using uh, the handle at IIEA. So with that, uh, Congressman Boyle, uh, Brendan, you're very, very welcome indeed. We're delighted to see, to see you here with us at the Institute. Uh, the virtual floor is yours. We look forward to your remarks, and then we look forward to the wider conversation uh, that we'll have um, later. Welcome. Yes, well, thank you. It's wonderful to see you again, uh, Michael. I, I could be wrong on this, but I believe the last time I saw you is we both um, bumped into each other leaving uh, Charlotte, North Carolina for um, uh, what was uh, then President Obama's um, uh, Democratic acceptance speech for a second term as yes. president. Michael was still ambassador. And don't worry, in that capacity, he went to both the Democratic and Republican uh, conventions, but a nice advantage of, of being ambassador. Unfortunately, one of his successors, Dan Mulhall, uh, kind of uh, you got the short end of the stick this year uh, being ambassador during a presidential election in COVID, and you didn't have the sort of usual presidential uh, campaigns that, that you typically have. Uh, but it's great seeing Michael again had an opportunity to work a little bit with him when I was a, a state legislator. And then, of course, more closely with uh, two of his successors now, Ann Anderson and, and Dan Mulhall, uh, as uh, Irish ambassadors to the U.S. I thought what might be helpful, since uh, I have about you know ten minutes or so, and I don't want to exceed that, since generally I find that the Q and A ends up being more fruitful anyway. Um, before I talk about the Biden administration specifically on foreign policy, I could take a step back a second and kind of root 
um, this in its context. I think that might be helpful. So if you look at, um, we've had now about three quarters of a century of the post-World War II era. And looking back at most of those 75 years, you would have to say that on the really big issues, for as much partisanship as there is, especially right now in, in America and in Washington, um, and one might even say hyper-partisanship between the two parties, there has by and large been a bipartisan consensus on some of the really big issues of foreign policy. For example, the, maybe the biggest of all, the whole concept that the U.S. would lead the transatlantic relationship. That manifests itself in many ways, especially through NATO, um, support for the European Union, um, but essentially that has been the bipartisan U.S. foreign policy, whether it was Democrats like Harry Truman and JFK, Republicans like Dwight Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, all the way up through 2016. Donald Trump in the last four years has turned that on its head, uh, often making common cause with and showering uh, real affection on dictators like Kim Jong-un, even saying at one point, and no, I'm not making this up, even saying a couple times now that he and Kim Jong-un fell in love. Uh, imagine Ronald Reagan or John F. Kennedy or Dwight Eisenhower saying such a thing about a brutal dictator who has indeed starved to death uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands, uh, while at the same time, an American president and Trump going out of his way to really bash uh, Chancellor Merkel of Germany, as well as leaders of other allied countries. So now it's 2020, or actually it'll be January 2021. President Biden is coming into office, having to essentially repair a number of relationships with our traditional allies and answer the question, is the U.S. even really still committed to the transatlantic relationship? Does Europe have to look elsewhere or within itself in terms of its own army, its own defense, et cetera? So if I were to come up with a, a phrase, you know, the campaign used the slogan, build back better, and um, that was mostly focused on domestic policy. I think it can apply to foreign policy as well, but I would also add to it a return to normality, that you will see Joe Biden investing a good deal of time on this subject on which he is quite passionate, and that is uh, rebuilding the transatlantic relationship, uh, restoring the idea and the ideal that the United States is a beacon for those countries that are uh, struggling democracies. It is a uh, leading advocate for human rights, not always necessarily perfectly or perfectly consistent, but nonetheless, uh, a country that is constantly preaching the gospel of liberty, democracy, human rights, et cetera. And I think you can glean a lot in terms of what the, bar the Biden foreign policy will look like by the speech he gave in Munich in early 2019 before he was a presidential candidate. Biden did not give many speeches as a former vice president, knowing that he would possibly run for president. That was a trip he made. Um, and, and I would encourage everyone to go back and look at that speech because I think now two years on, it is very instructive. I also, while I'm not a, a European, I think I can predict how most of my European friends will, will re react to a, um, an American return to normality. And I think you can see it in the ovation that uh, then Vice President or former Vice President Biden received uh, in Munich that afternoon when he gave his speech. It was in clear contrast to the dead silence then Vice President Pence received uh, that morning. So, Everything, I think, with, with Ireland, with Brexit, with all those other issues, I think, have to fit in that overall frame of what I think um, the Biden foreign policy will look like. Now, why don't, why don't I pause there, Michael, and then can address the specific questions and specific issues. But I kind of wanted to root uh, us in, in the larger context that we're really in, because I do believe that will very much guide 
the Biden foreign policy over the next four years? Yeah, so, so thanks uh, indeed, um, uh, Brendan. Thanks, Congressman. Um, uh, the questions are already beginning uh, to come in and we'll come to them in a minute. But just could, could I just go back to, uh, you know, what happened in November in terms of the election itself? Obviously, the headline uh, result is, is the election of, uh, of, 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 of President-elect uh, Biden. But it probably wasn't a great day, uh, you know, for the Democrats overall. I mean, what happened that this expected blue wave it didn't materialize at say at congressional level in the way that obviously you would have hoped for it was was there a, what, what was the what was the the difficulty there that what was the point of resistance yeah I, michael i've spent I, as as not just someone who's a congressman but as a lifelong for better or worse a lifelong political junkie i've been attempting to to think about previous elections like this and i couldn't come up with one i mean this was a very strange election result because typically uh, especially at the end of an election, things swing either one way or swing another way. In 2018, in the midterm election, all of the close races broke Democratic at the end. We ended up winning 40 seats, the most since 1974. Uh, we won back, that's to say, House Democrats won back control of the House of Representatives for the first time in a decade, uh, won a ton of state legislative seats. Basically, you saw in every row of government uh, Democrats were winning big in, in 2018. Um, 2020 was a mixed result. So at the presidential uh, level, it was a clear Democratic victory. Joe Biden won by 4.4%. This quirky um, uh, mechanism unique to this pandemic in which so many people, myself included, voted by mail, and so many states such as my own in Pennsylvania really weren't equipped or used to dealing with this since for many of us it was the first time uh, and they were pretty overwhelmed. So it took a while to count those ballots because of certain security measures, double envelopes and things like that. They take longer to count than your election day voting by machine uh, ballots. And then you had uh, this um, quirky reality that more Democrats uh, because of the pandemic wanted to vote safely by mail, whereas more Republicans being encouraged by Trump um, weren't as concerned about the pandemic and voted in person. And so that created the unique dynamic in which the results on election night skewed more Republican, but then once all the ballots were counted, you know, you saw where things actually were. And so I think that, that uh, in the end, the fact that Biden won by 4.4% has maybe been obscured by the early headlines where the race looked closer than in the end it actually was. But that's the presidential race. Then, Michael, you're right. As you talked about, when you get to the other races, it was much more mixed. Democrats did win, again, a majority in the House of Representatives, and that's nothing to, you know, um, breeze over lightly. It's only the second time in 30 years that Democrats have won the House of Representatives two times in a row. At the same time, it is a greatly reduced majority. It looks like we lost a net of about 10 seats, and we will have now the most narrow House majority uh, in more than 20 years. In the Senate, Democrats picked up at least one seat, um, but it looks like it was not an, pending the result of these two special elections in Georgia. Uh, it looks like it was just short of the projected majority uh, for, for Democrats to win. So the, the final result will be anywhere from 52-48 Republican to 50-50. Uh, um, and then as you go down the line and look at other races, state legislative races, other statewide offices, you again see this mix, even here in Pennsylvania. We had three other statewide um, races that, that you know, no one would really be uh, paying attention to outside of here. But I point them out because they prove exactly what I'm saying about the closeness and the mixed nature of this result. Democrats won one, Republicans won two, and all three races were within a couple points of one another. So what that shows you again is just how politically close things are uh, in the United States. And, and some of these results are really decided by the margins. And so with a very close Democratic House, a very close likely Republican Senate, in order to get anything done legislatively, it will have to be very centrist uh, type of legislation, not far right or far, uh, not far right or far left, 
you can see why, given that political reality, it will be quite enticing for Joe Biden to spend even more time on foreign affairs and what he can do um, uh, as an executive outside of Congress, especially in dealing with COVID. I wouldn't be surprised if you see Biden um, spending more time in those two directions just because of how close and tight the margins are in Congress. Yeah. And uh, Brendan, the, um, obviously, uh, uh, President Trump did secure whatever it is, something in the 70, millions, uh, uh, 70 million people voting for him. Um, uh, President-elect Biden obviously was a good 7 million ahead of him, which is um, a very substantial yeah. uh, margin. But nonetheless, I mean, uh, and, and given everything that's happened since, um, mm -hmm. uh, th th there, it does suggest a kind of a pretty serious divide in US, uh, US society. How is that? Is that? Is that? Is that uh, the reality? And and if it is the reality, to what extent uh, can that um, that divide, uh, uh, if it is a serious divide, uh, be bridged? Um, you know, in, in a Biden administration. Um, I I think it's a real challenge. I mean, things are, as I said previously, pretty close um, politically between the two parties. And, you know, Donald Trump, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Democrat, I, I think basically almost anyone can see that he is an enormously divisive figure who fans the flames of division constantly, whether it's on Twitter or the rallies that he loves to attend. Um, by the way, rallies that I think he will continue bizarrely even as an ex-president just because he clearly as a person in, and an individual craves that sort of attention so much. Um, so this is uh, really going to be, you know, completely unprecedented. America's never had an, an ex-president who does these sort of things. Typically they retire, they become, if I could draw a rough analogy, ex-presidents in our system almost become de facto monarchs. And what I mean is they tend to stay out of politics um, when you do see them, it tends to be in a role of trying to bring people together. Um, you might remember former President Bill Clinton, former President George Herbert Walker Bush, both jointly doing charity <laughs> things, the uh, relief for the tsunami uh, back in, I think it was 2004, maybe 2005. Um, that's typically the role ex-presidents play, Jimmy Carter building homes for Habitat for Humanity. Maybe occasionally they would delve into politics, certainly when Hillary Clinton was running, you know, Bill was there to campaign for her, kind of a unique circumstance. But generally, that's what we expect from ex-presidents. Donald Trump will be, will be very different. So um, those uh, divisions, I think, will continue in American society. I am very concerned about the way um, American society is self-sorting, it's uh, self-sorting. And what I mean is you were seeing, and it's interesting, you see a little bit of this in other countries' politics as well, that as the democratic coalition becomes more uh, well-educated and upscale, it becomes more concentrated in urban areas, not just cities, but also um, more upper middle class suburbs around those cities. And then in more rural areas, away from metro areas, you were seeing what was already a Republican area becoming the deepest uh, shade of red. And, and that sort of division is just not healthy for society. I think we're seeing it in England as well, by the way. Um, and certainly the Brexit vote uh, revealed that. So what we do moving forward to bridge that divide of people wanting to live uh, near and with those who are like-minded, I, I think that's a bigger issue than just politics. I, I think that is, is a more generational societal uh, issue that we have to tackle. Okay, let me just take, go to a few questions. I see a question here from Ted Smith, who is a former colleague of mine. Uh, he says, um, living now in the United States, uh, he says, thank you, uh, Congressman, for your intensive support of the Irish Americans for Biden campaign. He said, how important was it to mobilize the Irish American vote um, uh, for November's election? Yeah, well, Ted is great and, and did a lot, uh, certainly worked hard to help ensure that Joe Biden won Pennsylvania by one point instead of losing it by a point uh, like four years ago. So I, I, I am proud of the fact I think we made a, a critical difference uh, here in my state. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, the, uh, the Irish American vote and then a little more broadly, I would say the white 
Catholic American vote, which is a good quarter, uh, you know, 25% of the American population, uh, is important because it is very much a swing constituency. Uh, it tends to be, on average, better educated in um, either middle income or uh, a bit above average income. And so in, in some ways, by those measures, you would think it should be a more Republican constituency. But I think given history, given you know, concern for the poor, concern for um, certain um, you know, values issues in terms of society, historic support for organized labor, that kind of you know, pulls some, some more folks to the Democratic side of the aisle. Uh, but it is an incredibly important uh, swing constituency. And I, I think some others who, you know, um, maybe just look at all of us who have rather pale faces as quote unquote white and, and put everyone in that same bucket misses these nuances of difference, how you can appeal to people kind of separately. And in the Biden campaign, you know, we had a special outreach to Eastern European ethnic Americans who tend to uh, be more Republican supporting. And certainly that was the case in, in the Reagan era. But we thought we had, you know, a real possibility given Trump's cozy relationship with Russia uh, and, and his lack of support for Ukraine. So we made a special outreach there. We had a, uh, an outreach to um, people of faith and different faith communities. And I think that that was a great way to campaign that frankly has been lacking in democratic campaigns at the presidential level in recent years. Specifically to Irish Americans, the fact that um, Joe Biden was pretty vocal uh, when it came to the Brexit issue, that I think was helpful. The fact that his um, heritage is uh, sincerely something that's important to him, I think that that was something that we could trumpet and that we could run on. Uh, and so I think it made a real difference. It's not the case, obviously there are a lot of Irish Americans. It's not the case that every Irish American cares about uh, Brexit or is even knowledgeable about it, but there is still a certain number who do, and that's a pretty large number. And, and so being able to tap into that and say, well, you know, you might agree with Republicans on issues X and Y, and you might agree with Democrats on issues A and B, but here is why, here's the big reason why you should vote Democratic and why you should vote for Joe Biden. I think we were able to, to make a real difference. Okay, uh, a few questions here, including one from, uh, I see from David Kelly from Aralia, in around the question of, I suppose, Irish influence, um, again, on, not on relation to what you've just been talking about. David wants to know, uh, when he first of all, he says, President-elect Biden's uh, support of the Good Friday Agreement as part of the Brexit debate was very welcome. Has the Irish-American lobby declined in recent years, or is it as prevalent as before? And I suppose, you know, having been in the United States for so many years, we were always mindful of whether you know, how strong was Irish America? How strong would it be in the future? Were there young people like your good self coming through? Uh, uh, so I suppose, uh, uh, how can Ireland best assure um, uh, that its influence, the influence that it does have in the United States, particularly at congressional level, but now, of course, at the center of power itself in the White House with, with President-elect Biden surrounded by, indeed, so many Irish Americans. How can Ireland, I suppose, uh, assure uh, the, 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 um, that, 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 that Irish-American dimension um, and its, its, um, its importance is protected in the future. Is, is there anything that we should be doing that we're, we're not doing? Yeah, I, well, first, I, I, I want to give credit where credit's due, so I don't want to uh, swipe a, a good line without uh, some attribution, but a, a journalist um, said something to the effect of a couple months ago that this past year was um, the strongest moment for Irish Americans in Washington since the Good Friday Agreement in the 1990s. I mean, think about it. You saw the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, me, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, a gr another group of about eight or so members of Congress, travel to London, travel to Dublin, travel to Belfast to make clear our strong support for the Good Friday Agreement and our opposition to any US-UK trade deal if the UK were to violate the Good Friday Agreement in leaving the, the EU and the manner in which they would leave. Um, you then had, uh, you know, uh, the, at that point, Democratic presidential candidate who was leading in the polls tweet pretty emphatically the same position that is supported again by his top foreign policy advisor, who is now going to be the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, as well as all the support on Capitol Hill. 
that is pretty remarkable for a country, we think about the Republic of Ireland, about 5 million people, and then all told the island of Ireland, uh, just about seven. So I, I would say that, that this year really showed the sort of influence, uh, an outsized influence that, uh, that Irish America has. Now, in terms of the future, it's also the case that I am the only member of Congress with an Irish born parent. Uh, mm -hmm. After 1965, it has been far more difficult to legally come to the United States from Ireland. I was fortunate, my family was fortunate that when my dad came in 1970, he was sponsored by an older sister, his Aunt Breach, who had come in 1960. So the 10 year age difference um, between the two of them turned out to be you know, uh, pretty helpful given that, that, uh, that she got in before the changes in 1965. So as we look forward, um, I do have some concerns that we really do need to reopen and restart that pipeline. Of course, it isn't just U.S. immigration law that is the reason why you've had a decline in Irish immigration. There's also a, a good reason for the decline in, in Irish immigration to the U.S., and that is the strong Irish economy. When, when my father left exactly 50 years ago, he was 19 years old, coming from County Donegal, leaving a country that had at that point, and I looked it up not too long ago, the unemployment rate was somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. Um, that's not the experience of my cousins uh, in Ireland a, a generation later, and certainly not the experience of those younger than me who are growing up in Ireland today. That's something to be very happy about. There isn't that mass need for emigration. Um, but that said, for those who do want to emigrate, whether they're uh, more skilled labor or like my dad and like the traditional Irish immigrants of yesteryear, uh, more uh, blue collar, um, they're the people who help build America and there should be a legal mechanism for them to, to be able to come to this country. Uh, I think it's in you know, the best interest of Ireland and the US-Irish relationship, but it's also in the best interest of America. Um, okay. I say probably a, a little bit biasly on that point. That's okay. But just uh, so uh, future flows of, of immigration, um, do, you, do you think that realistically is something that we can, that, that can be achieved for those who want to, um, to avail of that? And secondly, I suppose, and I suppose more emotively, uh, to, you know, the, 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 the whole question of the plight of the, undoc the current undocumented in the United States, which, which seems to be, uh, have been without resolution now for, for, for many, many, many years. Um, with the Biden administration, are we maybe pinning too much optimism in, 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 in the possibilities that he or indeed uh, the current Congress have of, of, of addressing some of these issues in ways that will make a difference for Ireland? The, um, to show you how long, Michael, we've been dealing with this issue, um, and you certainly will have memories of it from when you were ambassador here, uh, the first major effort on immigration reform was the Kennedy-McCain bill. And both of those legendary senators are frankly, you know, no longer with us, no longer alive. So basically this whole, you know, effort uh, has been about 15 years. And the irony is for all the legislative failures and immigration reform, polls show, this is in part thanks to a reaction to Donald Trump, immigration reform has never been more popular in the United States. That's the irony. Uh, last poll had 68% of the American people favoring uh, immigration reform. Now, the challenge is, and it goes back to the fact the base of the Republican Party is so against it, and they make this such an issue of importance that it's very difficult if you're a Republican leader to put that bill on the floor uh, up for a vote. So I think a widespread immigration reform will be, again, a challenge to achieve, even though polls show that a, a pretty big uh, majority of Americans support it. I will say specific to the Irish though, there is outside of comprehensive immigration reform, there is the E3 visa issue, um, which we were able to pass last Congress in the House unanimously by a voice vote. And in the Senate, one Senator, a, a very Republican, a very conservative Republican, Tom Cotton from Arkansas, uh, unfortunately was able to hold it up. So I am, I'm still optimistic actually about the E3 issue. And if we were able to get that, and for those who aren't versed, basically Ireland would be able to take advantage of a visa program that right now is only reserved for Australians. Uh, that would, I think, go a long way to solving that pop, uh, problem and reopening that pipeline. 
Okay. Let me just brought it out to Brendan now to the, the wider agenda, the, the trade issues and the transatlantic issues, if I, if I may. Uh, we have a question here from John McNally uh, on the question of the, um, the prospects of, um, he wants to know, will an EU trade agreement uh, be prioritised by the Biden administration? Of course, you're on the Ways and Means Committee, and of course, our good friend Richie Neal is, is chairing the committee, um, uh, another great uh, Irish American. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, I suppose, will, will, um, will, will the president elect, or will President Biden, will he prioritize um, relations with Europe um, uh, in the ways that you seem to suggest, particularly since his uh, Munich speech in 2019? But I suppose um, the questions, a question, and there's more than one question here, on the prospects of a, EU, a US um, EU trade agreement, of course. Uh, is, is something that would obviously very be, be very important for Ireland as well. Yeah, I, as I mentioned in, in uh, my introductory remarks, there's simply no question that the U.S.-EU relationship more broadly uh, will be a big priority for President Biden. Now, specifically uh, under that, the question of trade, I think the answer is still yes, though I would point out that, you know, for those who might be, you know, just focused on UK versus EU and which takes greater priority, there's still China. Um, and that will be the, the number one uh, issue of focus specific to trade. That will still be the number one issue. It is the issue that a lot of my constituents care about. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan agreement, interestingly, when it comes to dealing with China, the perception, I think, rooted in at least some reality that um, China takes advantage of the trade relationship with the United States, swipes intellectual property left and right. Um, there are a number of issues with the US-Chinese trade relationship that have to be dealt with. And just given the size of China, 1.3 billion people, given how many um, US companies are, uh, have a presence there, that will still be the number one trade relationship to have to grapple with. Once you get beyond China, there will be a, um, a changing of the priorities when it comes to the US trade relationship. Um, and when you look at the European Union, eight, nine times larger than the UK market, it includes the um, largest GDP country on the continent of Europe uh, in Germany. It's just no question that when you look at this pragmatically, um, it's pretty obvious which uh, you know, one should should take precedence, and and again, that that's regardless of, of sort of ideology. If you, if you take any of those lenses off, it's it's pretty clear uh, which one should be focused on. And so, I think you will see a greater priority put on attempting to reach a U.S. EU deal, though that ends up being more complex than a U.S. U.K. trade deal, um, just because you obviously have more you know more cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, there's a question here from um, uh, Kilda Quain, who's one of my colleagues at the Institute, one of our researchers, and just in essence, she wants to know, um, I suppose, how much of um, the President-elect Biden's foreign policy would be consumed on restoring its former international commitments, uh, you know, the commitments that President Trump has, has, has decided to abandon, uh, versus leading new initiatives. So, <laughs> you know, in, in, in dealing with all, with, with, with repairing the damage, I mean, will he have much scope for doing new things? <laughs> Well, I, you know, these, these things aren't mutually exclusive, right? So, for example, take the environment. Um, the old thing, which will be a pretty easy thing to do, is rejoin the Paris Climate Accords. We helped lead the drafting and the coming together in Paris. That was a major achievement of President Obama. The fact it was a major achievement of President Obama was the big reason why President Trump was so keen on us leaving it. Uh, rejoining that will be... Uh, pretty easy and, and straightforward um, mechanically and legally for the US to do. So that you could look at as a quote unquote old thing, but it's also part of a new thing and that is putting a, uh, a real emphasis on addressing and tackling climate change in a way that we haven't done before. I mean, this is a, a much bigger issue in the US now than it was even 10, 12 years ago. You saw that, um, or I hope you saw President-elect Biden um, put former Secretary of State John Kerry in this new created role specifically to deal with the environment and addressing climate change. We know that the, uh, the ticking clock is drawing closer to the day in, in which we'll cross the point of no return in terms of dealing with this issue. 
So I think it's a perfect example of how old and new um, go hand in hand in dealing with an issue. Yeah, and you mentioned there uh, EU or US, um, UK, the prospects of EU um, or UK, uh, uh, US uh, trade and a deal, of course, which was very much in focus um, in the context of uh, the issues that surrounded the, the protocol, the Good Friday Agreement, peace on the island of Ireland. Uh, to what extent are, are you, you happy now uh, that, that those issues, uh, which were the subject of agreement last week, uh, or substantially anyway, or substantively. To what extent do you think uh, the, the, the way has been cleared, at least on that front, uh, for um, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 the opening up of, of a dialogue with the, uh, the UK in terms of a trade relationship uh, between the US and the UK? And would that uh, take priority in any way? Or could you see it, it might be simpler than a, a, a US-EU agreement uh, but which comes first? Or, or are they both in parallel or does the EU get priority? Yeah, I, well, first, let's see how this um, ultimately gets resolved between uh, the UK and the EU in terms of, uh, in terms of the Brexit process. Uh, I'm glad that talks are continuing, but I mean, my, my calendar shows it's December 16th. And so uh, December 31st, only you know, a little over two weeks away, it's still something I'm concerned about especially given the fact the UK a year ago signed up to the Northern Ireland Protocol and then suddenly in September said essentially, never mind, we're going to violate uh, international law. Um, so I'm glad that they backed down from that and they are again uh, agreeing to um, what they signed up to a year ago. Uh, but that said, I, I will not breathe easily until we get um, final resolution on, between, the, uh, between the UK and the EU. Now, um, in terms of the question you asked about priority for the trade relationship, I, again, uh, like I said earlier, when you look at the, the difference in size, the EU is simply far larger and includes the single most important um, country on Europe, uh, on the continent of Europe, but that even includes the UK. So Germany is the largest GDP of a European country. It's an enormously important strategic relationship uh, for the US. If one is, uh, you know, just looking at things pragmatically, it's pretty obvious that that is the, the relationship that um, should be focused on, uh, US, EU, and I think trade is a part of that. Now, the one thing I think that goes into the UK's favor is it is a little more straightforward and easier to do a bilateral deal, e even though a US, EU deal would technically be bilateral, let's face it, you have France in there attempting to protect certain industries. You have other countries attempting, attempting to protect jobs in different industries. That just does take more time and become more complex than, than say, dealing uh, with, with one country. But that having been said, uh, I still think that a US-EU trade deal uh, takes precedence, and you will see that now suddenly uh, up the, uh, the ranking order. Okay, and just going back to the uh, internal market, uh, um, uh, the controversy, uh, the issues uh, within that that were so controversial. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, that um, um, uh, the, 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 the Johnson, Boris Johnson's administration, uh, would have been concerned about the American um, uh, concerns about, about the internal market bill and its implications for peace in the island of Ireland? In other words, the US influence in terms of getting the US or the UK to back down um, as it seems to have done in terms of the internal, the, the, the controversial provisions within the, 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 the internal market bill. And was this a demonstration of, of, of Irish American muscle uh, um, uh, no, I, writ large? Uh, well, I, I, um, it, it's funny, I, you know, typically when one talks about me, muscle is not the first word that comes to uh, come to mind. But um, I will say that I was gratified that a number of MPs um, in London with whom I'm friends, as well as a number of journalists uh, who, who cover the British government, have told me that the pushback from the U.S. and the strong vocal pushback surprised them and weighed on this government's thinking. Ultimately, though, I wouldn't be the person, you know, to, to say or verify, you know, the extent to which that is true. Uh, I would only say I hope and believe that it had a, an impact uh, we're really uh, attempting to ensure that uh, there's a just solution here and one that ultimately um, preserves the peace process. And, and I hope we've achieved that. Very good. 
Maybe I'm going to jump around a little bit now, if I may, Brendan. I mean, just a variety of questions which uh, uh, you know may may see us going back and forth across the Atlantic. But um, in terms of the issues involved, I see one hint here from Donald O'Brolicon, who's a member of our institute. And he said, or he says, or he asks, given the deep uh, divisions within the United States within U.S. society, would it be a strategic error uh, in terms of um, enhancing democratic governance for President-elect Biden to focus on foreign affairs? as opposed to issues, e.g. declining living standards outside metropolitan areas, um, uh, 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 big being too big to fail, health infrastructure, I suppose the extent to which he can really focus on foreign policy issues um, when there are so many domestic issues that need uh, clearly quite urgent attention. Yeah, this is a tension um, that any president uh, faces. Uh, and I go back, I think of the early 1990s, one of the things that hurt uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president, he got hit with the perception that he spent too much time on foreign affairs and not enough time paying attention to the needs and concerns of ordinary Americans. Uh, perhaps some of that um, was, you know, was unfair, uh, but there's no question that perception hurt him. So I think it's always a challenge for any U.S. president because let's face it, uh, for anyone running for office most of our voters care about domestic issues. And foreign affairs, as important as it is, tends to only rank highly when there's something big going wrong. Um, ISIS was in the news a lot around four or five years ago because of the awful sort of videos that we would see online and the fact that ISIS was on the march. So you then saw that uh, issue rise uh, in the opinion polls in terms of things that people cared about. But otherwise, generally, it's healthcare, it's education, it's jobs. Right now, obviously, COVID-19 mm -hmm. would be far and away the number one issue. So making sure President uh, Biden strikes that right balance between addressing the issues that people care about and will make a meaningful, measurable difference in their lives with the responsibilities on the world stage. But I I'm pretty confident that, that President Biden will be able to do that. You know, uh, one... Uh, one aspect to Biden that I think is sometimes overlooked is the fact that he has so many years of experience. And what I mean is that's pretty obvious that, you know, he spent so much time in Washington, D.C. He's been a senator or was a senator from 1972 to 2008. And often that's presented as a negative. I look at it very differently. The fact that you have someone who has been a conventional politician for so long means he gets this. He's been around it basically his entire adult life. Uh, there's a real advantage to that. There, go figure. There's a real advantage in, to, in someone who actually has a lot of experience in this. Uh, and so I, I have real confidence that Joe Biden will be a very good president. And I think that he, his skill set very uniquely meets this moment. Yeah. And just uh, back on the U.S. domestic agenda, again, I see a question in here from Paul Sweeney, who's a member of the Institute at a former trade union um, economist, indeed. Um, and he wants to know, will, will, will Biden, President, Pre President Biden, reverse uh, President Trump's uh, tax cuts for the rich? Um, so the, what's called the TCJA, Washington, D.C., is horrible with, coming, with giving an acronym to basically any piece of legislation or agency that has ever created. But the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which is what Republicans called their big um, $2 trillion bill that passed in 2017 that President Trump signed, it was, in my view, uh, egregious. It was so tilted to the top 1%. Uh, according to the Nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, which is legally required to do these projections, 83% of that tax cut, 83%, went to the wealthiest 1% of Americans at a time when you have record wealth and income inequality in the United States. So uh, I certainly am pushing um, for President Biden to reverse a lot of the damage that was done uh, in that tax cut. Uh, now, this is where control of the Senate really makes a difference. If, if we're talking about a 52-48 or 51-49 Democratic Senate, as I thought we would be talking about pre-election. Instead, right now we're talking about a 50-48 Republican Senate. Maybe we'll get to 50-50, depending on what happens in those two seats in Georgia. Uh, but that will make a big difference. Just a, a couple senators one way or the other 
will make a very big difference in terms of what can be achieved here uh, in reversing a number of those very egregious tax giveaways to the uh, the richest uh, Americans. Um, do you think at some point beyond COVID, we are going to have to seriously look at revenue raising measures? And the way to do that clearly is Americans who make more than $400,000 a year. That was something Joe Biden talked about a lot in the campaign. It's actually popular. You know, there's a perception that raising taxes is never popular. When he was talking about raising taxes on the rich and raising taxes on those who make more than 400,000 a year, poll showed it, it actually polled quite well. Um, so I, I think that is something we're gonna have to turn to, but the arithmetic in the Senate does make achieving it more challenging. And, and how optimistic would you be, uh, Brendan, in relation to those two Georgia seats? Um, would you be optimistic that, that, that you can get one, if not both of them? You know, it is amazing. Georgia, um, in our lifetime, has gone from a solidly red Republican state to now very much a 50-50 state. It shows you the changing coalitions in both parties. So many of those suburban, upper in, suburban Atlanta, upper income voters have uh, flipped from Republican to Democrat, combined with the fact that Georgia is a little bit more diverse today. And when I say diverse, I, I don't just mean it in the white black context that the word is often used. I mean that Georgia actually is a much higher Asian American and Hispanic American population that we tend to think about when we think of, of the South. So the combination of increased diversity, but especially the migration of white suburban voters from Republican to Democrat in the Trump era has really helped make Georgia now essentially a 50-50 state. Um, if you looked at what happened in November, Joe Biden narrowly carried uh, Georgia by under one percentage point. But in other races, such as the Senate races, when you add up all of the votes were cast, Republicans did a couple points better. So I would say right now, I expect it to be very close. I think we're the underdog in both of those uh, races. But you know, I think it's probably in the end gonna be 51-49, one way or the other. And when the margins are that close, anything can happen. Okay. Just want to go back on to the um, uh, the the immigration issue again, and um, not specifically related to Ireland. There's a question in here uh, from Shona Murray, who's the European correspondent uh, from Euronews, and it um, she wants to know what's um, President-elect Biden's policy on children separated from their parents and put in cages. Will he pledge to reunite those families and help them with the trauma they've suffered? I, I uh, can't believe that. Um, and, and this is no offense to the person who asked the, the question, it's a quite right question to ask. I just can't believe the question even has to be asked. I, I never thought in my lifetime I would see the United States of America pursue some of the policies it did at our border under the Trump administration. I think it's something that 50, 60, 70 years from now, my grandkids will be reading about in the history books with real horror. Um, I think we have a clear moral and legal responsibility to reunite these kids uh, with their parents. I, I, I'll, I'll just stop there. Absolutely one of the most disgusting things to happen the last four years, and, and that is really quite the statement. Thank you for that. Thank you. So just, um, um, we're, we're coming, we're running a bit tight on time now, so I'm going to take in as many questions and uh, maybe just uh, one here from, um, Peter McLoon, who's an IEA board member, he says, will the US under President Biden immediately restore funding and support the essential work of the WHO? So this is lightning round, so I won't, I won't uh, you yeah. know, give substantive and detailed answers as I would like. So I'll simply just say yes. Good. Um, a few more lightning questions, uh, some of them my own and some of them reflecting kind of questions that have come through. Um, um, just, um, uh, Will President-elect uh, Biden appoint a special envoy for Northern Ireland, do you think? I think that that's likely. In terms of timing, um, by the way, my phone's been ringing off the hook with certain, you know, a, a number of people would be interested in that position, <laughs> like, let me say. So that, that's the good news. Um, and, and I think that the U.S. dimension, uh, even outside of Brexit, I think there is still a role, a constructive role for the U.S. to play here. So I would hope so. It's certainly something I'd be pushing for. As then a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I was pushing the Obama administration toward the end to do it, was pushing early on the Trump administration to do it. Uh, I'm glad in, in my uh, friend of a bipartisanship, 
bipartisan friendship with uh, Mick Mulvaney. Uh, so I'm glad that he was appointed by President Trump. And, uh, and I do believe that uh, President Biden will appoint a successor and, and a new uh, special envoy. Okay, and as we're talking about, as we talked a little bit earlier on, on WHO, uh, just a little bit briefly on COVID, if we may, um, and particularly uh, with the, va the vaccines coming on stream, um, uh, when do you think that the U.S. might reopen uh, to um, uh, Irish and EU, EU travelers? You know, that specifically, I don't uh, actually know. I, I, I would be surprised if, if that has been determined to any degree of specificity. Uh, really, right now, the focus is on the vaccines, and obviously, we've had very good news. Um, the one vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, was approved here um, late last week. It looks like the Moderna vaccine will be uh, approved on Thursday. Um, I, I think we're making real quick, uh, actually, advancements in this area. So I, I think that that will inform then the decisions to take place on travel in both directions. Uh, as well as reopenings uh, here in the U.S. So on that, I think it's still TBD. And uh, do you think President Biden would be an early visitor in that context? To uh, Ireland, that is? I, I, I know he very much wants to. I mean, I remember campaigning with him in Iowa, and it was the night before the Iowa caucuses, and, and we were talking about the visit that he made uh, as, as vice president. We were talking about where my family is in, in Donegal and cousins I have in Mayo, and then his family in Mayo. So I know it's something that's very important to him. I have no doubt it will happen. Um, it'll just be a matter of fitting it in on the, the schedule. Uh, obviously, it'll be sometime post uh, COVID-19, that's for sure. Okay, um, just, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of optimism, of course, that, 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 that and um, uh, people are encouraged, obviously, by, by, in many ways by the, um, by the election of, of President Biden and um, almost believing that this is the answer to all our prayers, uh, whether on immigration and all sorts of other issues. But obviously, there, there are, I'm sure there are any number of issues out there where uh, an incoming uh, Democratic administration would also have views on some issues that are sensitive here in Ireland, like corporate tax issues, um, uh, for example. Uh, so, um, uh, I, you know, to what extent uh, should we be disabused of any idea that it's going to be all going our way uh, under President, Bi uh, President uh, Biden administration? Yeah, well, first, I, I think the, the good feeling and optimism is justified uh, overall. But you're right, nothing is ever, you know, 100% one way or 100% the other. Um, I, I always make the, the point, um, and I'm sure Michael probably had to cite this when he was ambassador, you know, um, I point out for my constituents, 90% of whom are not of Irish descent, I point out that actually um, Ireland invests a lot in the U.S., including in our district, that there are as many Americans working at Irish companies here in the U.S. as there are uh, Irish working at American companies in Ireland. Right now, it's about 125 to 150 on, on both sides. Uh, now, the, um, the challenge that we have in our economy of companies fleeing to lower tax jurisdictions is a real one. Um, President Trump often brought up Ireland in this context and really used it as, as kind of a, a whipping post. I think unfairly, I, first, I mean, the reality is Ireland's overall um, economic strength is not just because of that 12 and a half percent corporate tax rate. It also has an incredibly well-educated literate population that is English speaking with a legal system pretty similar to ours and is a geographic and cultural bridge between the United States and Europe. So I, I think actually those who would just point to the corporate tax rate uh, are um, really selling uh, Ireland short. Overall though, what I would like to see is the world community come together in a multilateral way to deal with this issue of tax avoidance. So not so much the rate I'm talking about here, but the idea that there are companies that are gaming the system and figuring out ways to pay no tax whatsoever. We have that problem with tax inversions, uh, corporate uh, inversions in the US. Though they've slowed down in the last year, uh, that is still a problem that is hanging out there. But I, I think that ultimately, this is something for the world community to solve because it, it doesn't just affect the United States. Okay, just, um, they were coming in the last few minutes uh, now, Brendan, but uh, we'll get maybe a few more questions in. One here from Francis Jacobs, who's, um, 
former head of the European Parliament office uh, in Ireland, and he says he's talking about uh, your own party, the Democratic Party, he says, seems quite divided between moderates and progressives. Um, he says, will this harm the Biden administration or will the narrow margins in Congress mitigate these divisions? Uh, the latter. Um, there, it, it, the same way President Trump uh, was actually a very good unifying and motivating force for the Democratic Party, the one blessing in disguise of having a narrow majority in the House means that whether you were an incredibly moderate member or incredibly left wing or somewhere in between, ultimately we need you on the team. I would also say, by the way, um, the media does, I think, uh, exaggerate the degree to which there are divisions within the Democratic Party, at least I would say from the perspective of a congressional Democrat. I mean, I, I'm on a conference call last night with a, a pretty wide spectrum of Democrats, some of whom you would identify as leading moderates, others you know their names uh, and clearly are on the progressive side. And we're working right now on a measure to attempt to change our uh, House rules that would make things easier and improve the process and, and we all actually get along quite well. So I, I would say be careful about what you read. Often um, it is exaggerated the, the degree to which there are differences or disagreements on our side. Okay, just uh, maybe one final question. Um, you had the, um, the clarity that came from uh, the Electoral College um, determination on, on Monday. So is the path now clear for uh, a smooth uh, inauguration of President uh, Biden on the 20th of, of January? Or are there more surprises uh, possible? Or any surprises possible? Yeah, uh, it is over. Uh, and I know that Saying something definitively in the year 2020, uh, you have to be immediately looking for wood to knock on um, and keeping your fingers crossed. But I can say very confidently, it is over. The Electoral College has met. Joe Biden at 306, ironically, the same figure Donald Trump got four years ago. Um, that combined with the fact that the Friday night beforehand, the Supreme Court in a 9-0 uh, decision actually, made clear that uh, there was no merit to um, any of the, the Trump uh, campaign legal efforts. Uh, and what's interesting is three of those Supreme Court members were appointed by President Trump. A majority on the Supreme Court uh, are conservatives and are, have been appointed by Republican presidents. So the fact the judiciary has showed no willingness to entertain these crazy lawsuits, combined with the fact the Electoral College has now met, it is definitive, it is 100%, it is over. Joe Biden will be sworn in as president on at noon, at noon Eastern time on January 20th. Okay. Um, on that basis, I think we're going to uh, conclude. It's, it's coming up to two o'clock Irish time. It's a little bit earlier in the morning for you. And we want to just say thank you to you, Brendan, Congressman, for, uh, for joining us today, for giving us the benefit of your, your insights um, and, 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 and just uh, the clarity that you've brought to, uh, to a number of issues. Um, it's great that Ireland has such wonderful friends in the United States. Uh, as you said, on both sides of, of the aisle, we had the privilege of having Mick Mulvaney, indeed, on one of our webinars a little bit further back. But, uh, you know, it is just, um, for Ireland, obviously, it clearly remains a matter of huge importance that we have uh, people who relate to Ireland, who are Irish, uh, who are Irish antecedents uh, in positions like yours. So I just want to uh, salute your success. Of course, congratulate you on your own re-election. Uh, uh, it's not inconsiderable, uh, um, and a very big margin indeed. And to just say, uh, you're welcome back to the Institute anytime, hopefully, when the corridors reopen in terms of travel between Ireland and the United States and vice versa, uh, that you'll find your way to Dublin, find your way to Ireland, or find your way back to Ireland indeed, and, and come to our Institute, and that we may have a session in person uh, where we can uh, continue this conversation, and we look forward to that. But in the meantime, just a warm um, and uh, genuine um, 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 salutation and I wish you and your team there a happy Christmas and, 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 and look forward to uh, our further engagement and future engagement indeed. Well, thank you uh, very much. I enjoyed it. I'm glad a very substantive session that we're able to get a, a lot of questions in and I very much look forward to being able to be with you in person uh, in Dublin, hopefully uh, sometime for all of us soon. Thank you. Okay, happy Christmas. Good day. Thank you indeed. Take care.